Thank you. All. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm pretty excited about tonight. Uh, we have an excellent panel, uh, and I recognize uh, quite a few faces in the room, and quite a few I don't recognize it. And I think that it speaks to uh, what a huge issue this is. And I think uh, we'll be probably in the municipal election coming up, and uh, and beyond. Uh, and certainly is a pressing one right now. Um, so I'm going to move to introduce the panel, uh, and then from there. Uh, I'm going to invite the panel to um, uh, speak. So uh, we've got from uh, our right to left, we've got uh, Carrie Michaels, who's an executive vice president of the BCGU. Uh, we've got Tuska Trong, um, who's the sustainability activist. We've got Arpinder Sandu, uh, the current vice president of QP Local 1767. Uh, and we've got Adrian Carr, counselor from Vancouver. So uh, very lucky to have you all. Um, and I just, I'm going to start off with, uh, I'm just going to introduce Tesco first because uh, I'm ask her to speak first. Uh, and so I'm just going to read a short bio for you. Uh, Tesco is a sustainability activist, uh, a serial change maker and an engagement innovator. Uh, it's an organizer for Jen Squeeze's Code Red Housing Affordability uh, Campaign in Metro Vancouver and a co-founder and co-director of City Hive, an organization dedicated to helping civic-minded youth help shape the future of their cities. Her passions lie at the intersection of youth empowerment, citizen engagement, and resilience building. Tesco currently serves on BC's Climate Solutions and Clean, Clean Growth Advisory Committee uh, and has served on the Mayor's Engaged City Task Force, uh, the Simon Fraser University Senate, and as a board chair of Sustainable SFU, uh, now Embark SFU. For her work, she was awarded both the President's Leadership and, uh, and Sustainability Award from SFU uh, and Vancouver's Greenest City Leadership Award. Uh, she has also been named on several top 30 under 30 and top 25 under 25 lists by Corporate Knights, the North American Association of Environmental uh, Educations, and the Starfish Canada in 2013, 2014, and 2016. So thank you, Tessica, and uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? I'm just... Mm -hmm. Maybe in the back. Okay. That sounds good. Can I do that? Thank you for that introduction, and, and thank you so much for the welcome as well, Victor. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tessica Trong, and uh, as Paul mentioned, I am one of the Code Red organizers here in Metro Vancouver for Generation Squeeze. And so Generation Squeeze is a member-based organization um, powered by tens of thousands across the country. I'm looking to build, build a better Canada for, that works for all different generations. Um, so we work in building a voice for Canadians in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, um, advocating for a voice in politics, but also in the marketplace as well. And so um, we, we're entering into this work uh, because I think as we all know, the reason why we're here is that we're in this code red housing affordability crisis. And I think that um, we need to be taking action on it. And so in terms of the work that we do at Gen Squeeze, uh, we push a three-pronged policy approach, which I'm very pleased to say is also quite reflected in, in the, um, I think there has a lot of parallels to the affordable housing plan, um, the affordable BC plan um, that the BC GU, GU has put forward as well. Um, but in terms of our three-pronged policy approach, uh, we look at one, and, and these, these three things have to work together. They're not one versus the other. We looked at taxation, we look at supply, and we look at demand. So um, the first piece of our policy uh, approach is we need to reduce harmful demand. Um, and in terms of that, we don't talk about whether it's foreign or, uh, or domestic, um, or we don't focus solely on foreign. We talk about harmful demand, and that's when fo folks are looking um, to use housing as a form of parking investments and, and speculating uh, when really homes should, or housing should be for homes first. And that's really the principle that we, um, that, that we use. Um, so in, in October uh, of 2016, we uh, put together um, uh, an event called Building Common Ground, much like this, where we brought different actors um, from the government sector, um, from nonprofit, and also from the development community to come together and talk about, hey, like we know we have many differences, but uh, there is a crisis and we need to build common ground to figure out what we need to do together. And I think similarly, we're reaching a moment as well um, where we're starting to see some movement at the, the provincial and the federal level. And I think there's a lot that we can do here to organize locally uh, leading up to the municipal elections as well. And, and I think 
there's a lot of literacy that needs to come um, to be able to educate and to figure out what are some policy solutions because we're not alone in facing these housing affordability challenges. If you look at other parts of the world, um, most of these major cities are facing some sorts of pressures on, on housing policy. And so um, if we look at solutions at different parts of the world, but also in different cities here, I think there's a lot that we can do. So going back to this three-pronged policy approach, the first is reducing harmful demand. The second one is actually creating a surge in suitable supply. So we don't talk about any, just any type of supply, um, but we talk about how do we build the right type of supply. So purpose-built rental, how do we build multi-bedroom um, um, family homes for folks, um, but also figuring out how do we do that in a way that it, we're not trickling out small pieces of supply because then folks are, are, are looking and trying to compete and bidding up prices. How do we open up boldly and looking at the built form of our cities to figure out how can we actually build more complete, compact communities? And so looking at this, and I think my background is, is really in sustainability, looking at how sustainability and affordability can really come together, that they're not divergent and um, dichotomous um, goals, but that we look at how can we build the right type of supply that also meets our sustainability goals. Um, and the final piece is around taxing housing wealth fairly, and I think there's been a lot of talk about this, especially with the BC budget and their new 30-point housing plan where they are starting, I think, to address or try to, trying to stabilize um, at least some of uh, the, or to correct the housing market in a sense. And so um, for those of you who haven't taken a look at it, I would encourage you to take a look at, you know, their, their speculation tax. Um, their increases to the foreign buyer tax, uh, their increases to um, uh, to school um, school tax as well for homes over three million. Um, and our position here at GenSqueeze is that, well, I think it's a step in the right direction. It's not enough, and I think we need to be demanding more bold action um, as well. And so, as we look at how income has really de been decoupled from um, housing prices across the region, uh, what we need to look at is is figuring out how as income has relatively remained stable and flat, how, how do we st stop taxing, or how do we start taxing the bad and start taxing less of um, what hasn't really grown? And so on the income side, incomes haven't really grown, whereas most of um, wealth acquisition has actually come through capital gains. And so how do we look at capturing some of that wealth and putting it back towards affordable housing? Um, so I think I'll end there on those three pieces, and I think that's also quite reflected in, in the Affordable BC um, Homes Act. I think the final piece um, that I'd like to share is just that we have an incredible opportunity to push in this next municipal election because really when we're talking about building the right type of supply, um, this next municipal election, the folks that we elect to be our representatives at the municipal level have a huge opportunity to imp influence the policies, the built form, um, and the, the supply that we're actually getting in the cities. So figuring out how we can talk to um, and, and, and mobilize around those pieces is, is really critical. And so if you're interested in volunteering and working with um, Gen Squeeze, we meet on a bi-weekly basis and organize um, at a regional level, but also specifically targeting certain municipalities to figure out how we can push the dial and advance housing policy that works for all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, our next speaker, Adrian Carr, uh, has been a Vancouver City Councilor since 2011. Uh, she was born in Vancouver, uh, earned a master's degree in urban geography from UBC, and then taught for 12 years at Vancouver's Langara College. Uh, Councilor Carr left teaching to join the executive team at the Wilderness Committee, uh, BCG certification, where she helped with protection for dozens of key wilderness areas. Uh, in 1983, she co-founded the BC Green Party, North America's first Green Party, and in 1984, co-founded the Green Party of Vancouver. She led the BC Greens from 2000 to 2006, then served as Green Party of Canada Deputy Leader from 2006 to 2014. She currently chairs the Vancouver elected Green Caucus, and is here tonight to speak to us about uh, the City of Vancouver's plans for affordable housing. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. And uh, first, may I acknowledge um, with gratitude that we are on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Laish peoples, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. 
thank you for your welcome. Um, and also, uh, Tesca, did you read my notes? <laughs> that was perfect, um, and I can't disagree with anything that you said. In fact, the, um, uh, the three areas, taxation, focus on supply, and focus on demand, are, are indeed what we have to do, and I see it's embedded in the documents that we see you as well. Um, I, you know, I want to start, I don't know if I really want to totally represent what the Green, uh, sorry, what the uh, City of Vancouver housing policy is, I can answer any questions on that, um, but not everybody around the council table votes always for every single policy, so there will be a bit of difference, um, and uh, some of the motions that I brought ho uh, forward have not passed, and I'll, I'll, you know, get to that if there's a, an opportunity around answering questions. Now, the first thing I want um, to be very clear about is when we talk about a housing crisis, we need to talk about housing that is unaffordable for the people who live and work here. You have to start with what you mean. And for me, um, and I think for most people that I talk with, housing is a human right. Uh, we don't define that yet constitutionally, but it is. And uh, so if you can't supply the housing that is affordable for the people in your city, you're missing the boat. You get to a housing crisis. In Vancouver, the housing crisis hits all sorts of different people. And so what is also important, I think, to convey is that there are people who are homeless, record numbers in this city. Um, there are people who need supportive housing and subsidized housing. They need social housing. That's another sector of need. There are people who need housing who are, well, I think it's unique, but they, they want to have housing that they, um, that's decent housing that is affordable both for rent and to own. So those are two very separate um, goals, focuses of attention, and demanding different solutions as well. So homeless, social housing, or people who have needs, um, renters, and people who want to own. So the solutions are not the same for all of those. We already know that you can't, as a city government, supply social housing. You just can't do it with the budgets that a city um, has. Although I had a conversation with you, and I'm the only councillor that actually has advocated for increasing taxation, um, uh, which is probably not popular among certain sectors of the city. Um, but as long as it's tied to, this is property tax, as long as it's tied to actually the kinds of services and solutions to problems that people can see relate to the tax that they're paying. I really believe people are willing to pay that extra tax if they know their tax is helping solve the problems that they're concerned about too. Um, in terms of the uh, social housing and the homeless end of it, we need the support of senior governments. We cannot, um, as a city, we don't have the tax base uh, to actually build and sustain social housing or housing um, for the homeless, including um, housing like the temporary modular housing that is going up in neighborhoods around the city. Uh, partly it's because it needs ongoing support. As you know, it's not just a matter of building it. We are absolute willing partners in the production of it, providing land um, at like no cost, uh, with senior government coming in with the money to, um, uh, to build it, but also to maintain it because it needs subsidies on an ongoing basis, and that you need senior government help for. When the senior government was more involved in housing, especially federally, through, through CMHC, um, and a lot more money was coming forward, that's when we had uh, really no homeless. I, I, you know, I was born here, as, you, as somebody said, um, and there weren't homeless in Vancouver. There weren't people sleeping in doorways and begging for money. I mean, this city, with such wealth, has just become a tragedy in terms of equity. In terms of uh, supply, um, it's really um, important to know that Vancouver has been building more housing at record levels every year. So it's not, and it's not, and we're, our affordability has decreased. So it's not about building it's more, it's not supply, supply, supply that will get us to a solution. Um, it is supply that matches incomes. And you have to know that the average income of a renter, a single renter in the city is $32,000. That means having rent at $800 to be affordable. 
very hard. We, that's not being built right now. Um, and why? Why are we not building that kind of supply? I absolutely believe it's because our city is open to investment by anybody from anywhere in the world, including here, who has the money to treat housing not as a home, but as a place to speculate to gain income. And that, ha that, that is a huge problem. As long as we keep the door open to speculation um, we, and to treating housing as a way to make money, we will never have affordable housing. So I, I have um, argued for, I've had motions for, and I welcome the provincial government initiatives to tax speculation, to tax flipping, so the short-term turnover at profits of housing, and to make sure that, um, that housing, um, that there's a total transparency around who owns the housing in terms of the land title office, the bear trusts, you know, those things have to go. Um, finally, in terms of, um, of uh, supply, oh, by the way, on demand, you know, just as an example, when white, the, there's a property on Georgia, white spot, $245 million that property got flipped for. 200, you can <laughs> never achieve affordability. The tragedy too about that is that flipping, no government, no provincial government, no uh, uh, local government here in Vancouver got any of the benefit of that increase in land value. Yeah, shame in truth. Um, finally, in terms of uh, solutions, uh, just a couple of points that I want to raise on that. We do have to find ways to increase housing um, and the housing supply in a way that engages the public in those decisions so that people are not, you know, picketing, saying, not in my neighborhood. I think there are ways to find, find those kinds of solutions, and it's incumbent upon a city government to, to nurture the process that will get to those kinds of solutions. And in terms of uh, densification of single family lots, I voted against having infill housing. Gobbling up the space in a lot that's often used as a backyard and garden with yet another single family home. I don't think that's the way to go. I mean, why didn't we look at um, subdividing a home to multiple suites, for example? You know, anyway, going on too long, I think. <laughs> uh, but there are ways to, to increase housing uh, in that form and other forms in neighborhoods around Vancouver. Um, certainly we need to make it easier to legalize secondary suites so that they aren't shut down, which they are right now, and there's 30,000 of, of them in this city, so we need to do that. And finally, we need to make it easier to build rental. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, our next panelist, uh, Harpender Sandhu, uh, has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Geography and Economics from Simon Fraser University. Uh, he's the Vice President of QP1767, uh, that's the union representing BC Assessment workers. Uh, he's currently employed at BC Assessment, spending over nine years as a real estate appraiser. His work as an appraiser has included valuing a broad range of property types within a relatively short period of time, including residential, multifamily, development land, strata, and industrial. He has extensive experience with major property appeals involving owners, developers, agents, and lawyers. Harpender was recently re-elected to the Public Service Pension Plan Board as a trustee, uh, representing numerous unions, with a keen interest in environmental, social, and governance issues related to investment. And I'd like to add and emphasize here too, while the Affordable BC campaign uh, was launched by the BCU, this report was co-authored uh, by two members of QP Local 1767, uh, Harpender as well as Jared Melvin. Uh, whose contributions were invaluable, uh, and they were the first union local to actually endorse and join the campaign uh, and carry with them a wealth of knowledge. I, I know uh, Harpinder in particular uh, is, is a critical expert on this subject, uh, who has not had enough, I think, uh, audience for, for some of his analysis of, of the program. So thank you very much, and I'd like to welcome you up. for that intro, not going to live up to it. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for everyone. Uh, I'll try to kind of, we have the plan here, and so what I'm going to try to do is speak about it in more of a nuanced way, um, more layman's terms, uh, because the three of us got together to create this plan, um, more of a policy paper. We've got enough substance here to create a book, but um, 
some of it can be quite complicated. And this is what we hear when, you know, every day in the newspaper for the past decade, there's a real estate story. And so every day we're bombarded with more information and a lot of misinformation about how the market works and how it has to work and should work. And so being an appraiser, being surrounded by a lot of professionals in the government and um, knowing that what the industry is all about, um, we understand both sides. We understand the motive uh, on, on the private side and also government side. Now, the difference is they just haven't gotten together to find the right solutions. And so um, I'll narrow it down into three big concepts. First of all, banking. So we talk a lot about banking in here. And the key takeaway is that banking, the mortgage interest on that, you have to consider that as an additional tax. That's the fee that's being charged. Now, on the banking industry, you probably you know, hear that that's the cost, that's sort of cost of risk. So we're just pricing risk. However, when you have land that if you don't pay, let's say, property taxes on it, well, guess who owns that land eventually? It's going to be the government. They're going to repossess it. It's going to be taken back. So the concept of private property rights is why you see people um, come to particularly Commonwealth countries uh, and invest in Commonwealth countries because of strong private property rights. However, even that, that property right is somewhat of a loose term. So the banking industry is now loaning on that value, that productive value of the land. So when you have the banking industry squeezing, uh, increasing uh, interest payments from higher and higher values, that's in their interest to do so. So they want to lend more. I mean, back in 2008, we remember when we had 40-year mortgages for a short period of time. So for example, some people might say, well, you can't blame the banks, they're just doing what the market's telling them. But at the same time, we regulate the banks as a public, as a part of our government institutions, we're a part of that. So why is it that that 40-year mortgage isn't available anymore? Because it was too risky. And why were people allowed to borrow that much more? Because the rules that were set allowed for that. So you have to conceptualize that aspect of it, that the banking industry is also in, I guess, cahoots of the system. I mean, profits are related to this. So, but at the same time, we want development. People want to come here to BC. It's the best place on earth. They want to come here. They, it's beautiful. So we have the demand. We have the, uh, the place where everyone wants to be. So we have the inherent wealth already in our land. So that's the other shift. So number two, the concept of the land that we have. Now, you know, from, we can take some interesting takeaways from the First Nations people who look at land as more of a common property, common good. Um, it belongs to everybody. Um, and that concept is something I think where we try to start to gravitate towards because there's something very unique in that. When the government owns land even, it's in trust for everybody. They own it, it's be, you own it, we all own it. So now when you switch that over from private property rights where we have, let's say, uh, private land owned, now we want to start developing. Now for a government, how are you supposed to purchase land that went up in so high in value in such a short period of time? So like, I'll give you a quick stat. So basically, from the total value of property in BC, of all property, building and land, all development, is $1.86 trillion. Now, it sounds like a big number. If you compare it to 2003, it was, it was $469 billion. So you can see where it's gone in a short period of time. In 2010, it was $1 billion. Now, out of that 1.86 trillion, about 1.3 is just the land value alone. So the value is in our land. Um, so for us, we made some pretty bold statements. We've made them in, you know, in, in the media. We've made them to government that we have the solution. We've seen through the fog, and we're bold enough to say that this is the solution. The solution is to tax the land proportion value appropriately. Not the building, we, want, we don't want to tax more building, 
because we want to increase more development. We want to have a nice place to live. So if people are building, they're creating things. So why are we taxing that value? Why is the municipalities taxing developers uh, development cost charges and CACs? It's actually the whole system's designed backwards. So that end fee goes to the purchaser in the end. So now the concept comes down to, we talk about um, the land, we talk about the banking, and now finally supply. Um, the word supply and demand, you don't necessarily, we hear that thrown around a lot, but I think you, what you really have to focus on is what does supply mean? Supply should be linked directly to density. And density is what you are granted by government. Government that's owned by the people, all of us, we decide, we entrust people to decide how much density should be allocated in a particular parcel of land. And now that density is now created by us. We're the ones allowing for that density to occur. That's where the supply equation comes in. So, so far for the over a decade, we've looked at density for particularly luxury condos around transit lines, for example. For many investors within Canada, many investors in Canada and from outside of Canada are coming here because they want to invest in our land. So the density we create around it has really created more so, I call them safety deposit boxes in the sky um, because they want to hold value. It has a hold of value. And so for us, how do we solve this problem? We look at it as if you want to uh, solve the supply problem, you look at density. You demand the right density. So you demand density where it has affordable units attached to it. It doesn't have to be a tower, but it could be. So for example, let's say you did have a tower and it was a 100 story tower and you said, well, we want to mandate at least 25% of those units to be affordable. Now, the concept of affordable is somewhat loose. The government hasn't defined it. It's tough to define it. Um, as union leaders, we would probably lean towards defining it as what working people could afford, the whole range of working people. And so for affordable units, if you were to create a, a mandate that we have, let's say, a transit line, we all invested in our tax dollars, our communities, where we work, where we play, where we uh, invest our time to make our lives better, those transit uh, infrastructure that's been invested into that, all the profits from that lift in the land goes to private people who position themselves along that uh, new investment corridor. So how do we capture that? We need to po properly tax that land before and after that investment goes into there. And because we have, we're lucky enough to have uh, a government authority which is capable of having very accurate land values, um, we should utilize that. And so we also have very um, experienced people who focus on government, in, uh, focus on land in the government. We need to utilize them. We, we've been underutilizing people like that. So we have the solutions. They're all there. We have the capability. Now it takes um, all of us and you know our family, our friends, and everyone else to, again, see through the fog, just focus on the land and look at it through that lens and demand the right density. Now, the one question I'll get from a developer, and we've been invited to the housing conference uh, by the minister, Selena Robinson, Minister of Housing, and uh, we had roundtable discussions similar to this that we're setting up here. And, um, you know, we sat across developers. The first question we asked them is, are you, you know, developers get up in arms, you know, you can't touch our properties, we brought this for X amount of price, just leave us alone, it's what it, the market paid for. Fair enough, we agree. So we ask them, are you a land speculator or are you a developer? Well, they get all puffy chested and say, no, we build stuff, we're building the community. We agree, you do build stuff. So we wanna just tax that speculative value of the land increase, because guess who created that land lift? That's unearned income. You didn't create that, make that land more valuable. It was density, it was somewhat demand, and also us, government, 
we created that density. We gave that profitability, that increased value. So we, in turn, need to demand out of that density a, a share of affordable housing. So there's ways to get around, around that. Uh, hopefully we can discuss further, but that's the bigger concept that I wanted to kind of get into. Um, greater details in here, and I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of better ideas also. And um, thank you for your time. Thanks, our, our uh, final speaker, uh, certainly not least on the panel, um, is Kerry Michaels. And uh, Kerry's one of the uh, leaders, I think, of the uh, Affordable BC campaign, has done a tremendous amount of work on it, especially at the municipal level. Uh, Kerry was elected uh, as a BCGU Executive Vice President at our uh, convention in 2017. Uh, she's the second youngest person to ever hold the position and one of the youngest labor leaders in Canada to date. Uh, she joined the BCGU as a member when she and her co-workers at the Kuala Student Association formed a union, uh, unionized their work site uh, and, uh, in difficult circumstances at the time. And she quickly became active as a bargaining committee member uh, and as a steward, and I think the chair of the bargaining committee as well. Uh, no? And um, Carrie's a passionate advocate for social justice, education, and training. So thank you very much, uh, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for taking your time to be here on this evening, and thank you, Victor, for your welcome. You're probably wondering, what more is there to be said after all of these wonderful panelists? And um, I won't keep you too much longer before we actually break out into uh, tackling the issue at our tables. Um, but I wanted to uh, share with you a story and uh, some of the work that we've been doing in the communities. And um, so, in fall of last year, we were approached by a couple of our members in Surrey uh, who were facing an issue where the city council wanted to evict a couple hundred people from a neighborhood called Clayton Heights. And uh, this came as quite a surprise to a lot of the people who were living there. They received letters uh, telling them that they had to evict their tenants by January 31st. And, uh, they started talking to each other and they started planning what could we possibly do uh, to prevent this from happening because you're asking hundreds of people to find housing with less than 1% vacancy rates. You're asking hundreds of people to pick up and relocate their families in the middle of winter where they may or may not find another place to live. And they were outraged as anyone should be. And so they were quite well organized uh, from the get-go. They were able to get t-shirts made. They were able to uh, organize themselves to go to a city council meeting. Um, and they were able to, uh, to ask that this not go forward. They wanted um, the city council to step in and to legalize their suites because the city council was basically saying um, there's a number of illegal suites that are being occupied and there's a parking issue. We've had hundreds of complaints around parking and so you need to go. Uh, that was the other outrageous factor. Um, it wasn't about safety in the suites, there's no fire hazards, it was parking. Um, and so they go to the city council meeting and the city council does not respond with uh, their demands. And so they're like, we need to do something to escalate. And so their group comes together and they decide they want to plan a rally. And this is where we step in because we got a, I got a message from our members saying, we've never planned a rally before. Uh, what do we do? And so we started talking with them and helping them develop uh, their materials, their messaging, who was going to speak, did they have media contacts, and they were, they were amazing. They were very cohesive and they were also um, very on the ball and they had great, um, great people there to, to speak. They managed to find tenants, homeowners, all different voices. Um, and so they held a rally in November, very cold. Uh, they had uh, about 100 people come out uh, to the Surrey City Hall to, to say enough is enough. 
um, this isn't right, and you can't just put people out on the streets in the middle of winter because people are having a hard time finding a place to park their car. Um, and I think, you know, what's really important here is they, they weren't just talking about homeowners who, you know, wanted to keep their tenants, but these are people who were women fleeing violent relationships, who weren't sure where they would be able to go, people with families whose kids go to schools in that neighborhood who weren't sure um, where they could go, but also to pick up your kid and move them to a different school is just outrageous. Like that's um, not something you should feel like you have to do um, just on a whim. And so uh, they held this rally and at the next city council meeting, we all organized, we went there, big group, and the city council said, okay, we'll put a moratorium on the evictions. We'll stop the evictions. You will not be asked to leave by January 31st. Um, but that's only for six months. They said they were gonna revisit it in the summer and uh, see what they could do. And so while this community was able to achieve this great victory of being able to stay in their homes for another half year, it's not forever. And they're gonna have to continue those conversations and continue to put pressure on that city council to legalize their suites, to find ways for folks to actually get to um, a house or another place where they can live if they can't continue to stay in that suite, and to not displace a mass amount of people um, just because they've decided that this is the solution to one problem. Um, and to me, the heart of that message is um, a home is more than just four walls. And the premise of the plan and the campaign that we've put forward is that housing isn't an investment, it's a home. And the neighborhoods that we live in aren't just individual isolated homes. We have to build those relationships with each other and we have to build that power within our communities to actually keep, not only the communities that we have, but to improve them. And I'll just leave you with one other piece, and I think it's an important quote from um, an organizer in uh, Toronto, who was part of um, when residents were facing above guideline uh, rent increases, they held a rent strike in Parkdale uh, in Toronto. And I think it's very fitting uh, to say that um, what this organizer had said was that the strike served as a powerful example in that as long as you organize effectively, there is no limit to what you can achieve. And that's what we need to be doing in our communities all across our province is organize with our neighbors across communities to build that power so we can change the way um, our neighborhoods look and we can make sure that we keep housing at affordable rates so thank you thank you very much carrie so uh I want to thank again all the uh, excellent panelists and, and thank you very much for your time and, and for coming. That was excellent. I really appreciated it.